Good evening. I'm Ramiro Salazar, director of the San Antonio Public Library. On behalf of all the library staff, I want to extend to all of you a very warm welcome to your central library. This is a special evening for all of us, and the San Antonio Public Library is honored to be part of this event. San Antonio is a city is very fortunate to have so much talent in many arenas. In the literary world, we have lots of talent. And so, when I reflect on San Antonio, what we have to offer as a city, uh, we're so strong in the literary field that uh, one can help me proud of all the accomplishments of our writers, poets, and all of us that contribute to the literary, literary world. So I, I feel very proud. And I'm very proud that we're part of of this event. Uh, before I proceed with uh, the introduction of uh, our special guest, I would like to recognize some of our special guests who are here today. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, our chair of the Library Board of Trustees, Dean Brady, uh, Dan Nicholas, uh, board member, uh, district representing District 8, is also here. Uh, I'd like to recognize Patty Radel, former councilwoman for District 5, and now uh, member of the school board for San Antonio Independent School District. Thank you for being here. Tracy Bennett, president and CEO of the San Antonio Public Library Foundation. Uh, Tracy, thank you for your support and for hosting this reception. I also want to recognize um, Jordan Bexler, who is the chair of the Library Foundation's uh, Latino Leadership for the Library Committee. And speaking of this particular committee, I would like to recognize Dr. Alan Clark, who is the outgoing chair of this very important committee. You're welcome. I also want to recognize uh, Katie Plato, who is the director of the San Antonio Book Festival, and she and her committee uh, are working very hard uh, to bring to San Antonio in April another fabulous uh, book festival here to the Central Library. I'd like to thank her for her efforts. Uh, Linda Harper, former First Lady, is also in the audience. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, a very dear friend, very someone that's very special to San Antonio, is Carmen Tapoya, poet, author, writer, and the City of San Antonio Poet Laureate. We're so proud of you and so happy to have you here, Carmen. I also want to recognize my colleague, uh, Felix Padron, who also contributed to this event. And without uh, his help and the help of his staff, we couldn't make this event possible. So thank you, Felix. Thank you for being here also. So there were quite a few of individuals that got together, got excited uh, from our staff, Vicky Ash, who's one of the first champions to really do something to recognize. I'm not going to introduce the, the, our special guest because someone else will be introduced. But uh, there was a lot of excitement, uh, a lot of passion uh, to bring together this program. And obviously, by the very large attendance, you all feel very passionate about our work. Yes, of honor today. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Naomi Shihat Nye, who is the author of many books, who has been recognized, has received many awards, uh, who is also very dear to San Antonio, and is one of the, those talents that I refer to, again, that we're so, for, so fortunate to have. Um, she's also has been a huge supporter of the San Antonio Public Library, has supported the Young Pegasus, a youth poetry competition, not only as a judge, but also as an advocate. And so we're very fortunate to have Naomi uh, be part of this program, and she will introduce our guest of honor, Naomi. Good evening. So wonderful to see you all here. Thank you for coming out. It's a very special day. I realize it may seem indulgent to read
read a poem of one's own when introducing another poet. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to. Please forgive me. This poem was written 33 years ago. It's called For Rose on Magnolia Street. You ask me to take off my shoes, and it is correct somehow, this stripping down in your presence. Do you recognize in me a bone, a window, a bell? You are translating a child's poem about the color gray. I float through your rooms, peeking at titles, fingering the laces you drape from your walls. The first place I visited you, a tree grew out of your bedroom, hole cut in the ceiling. Today there are plants in your bathtub. Their leaves are thick and damp. I want to plant myself beside you and soak up some of your light. When the street lamps cross their hands, when the uncles shuffle home from the market, murmuring of weather and goats, you lean into a delicate shawl. The letters people write you begin glowing in your baskets. Yesterday you wrote of the dog man who wanders everywhere, followed by a pack of seven hounds. Soon you will tell us the secret behind our grandmother's soft hair. Well, she did, and she has, told us so many things in so many ways and places. Her voice of humane and dignified curiosity it says in the author's note for her exquisite new chapbook, Begin Here. Her deeply rooted interest in classical myths, folklore, family stories, and the history of both cultures that made her have been immense consolation and fortification in the lives of all of us. Thank you, Texas State Poet Committee, for recognizing her magnificence and naming her Texas Poet Laureate was a great act of wisdom on their parts. We are extremely lucky here in San Antonio to have not only our wonderful Carmen Tafoya as our city poet laureate, and look at the other Texas cities jumping on our bandwagon to do the same and name their own, but Rose as the first Latina, excuse me, how could this be, ever named to the post. Viva Rose. <laughs> Library for hosting this reading, and to the Library Foundation, and to Wings Press for republishing her prize winning, again for the first time, unforgettable book. If you do not have it, get it. If you have an old one, get a new one, and this beautiful new chapbook. Thanks to Beck Whitehead, and Leo B, and the School by the River Press, Southwest School of Art, for creating such a glorious edition. We are always, always beginning here and again. Rose's poems teach us this. Roberto Bonazzi, who's here tonight, wrote a marvelous review of her work recently for the San Antonio Express News. And thank you, Steve Bennett, for including his poetry reviews in the paper. He described Rose's poems as having narrative ferment chiseled in long, elegantly looping lines. He speaks of her affection for the labyrinth motif, and also I think of this in her work as a kind of fugue or counterpoint attention. I love the labyrinth by Juan Lifshitz, <coughs> cover of the book. I've always loved Rose's poem, Swallow Wings, which begins, I've been to church folks. I'm an east side messing Greek. And the ways she weaves together multiple mysteries, flying open closed memories and silences, radiating possibilities, hemming, and stitching. Diligently, decisively, patiently. Her poems sound, read, ring <coughs> like no one else's. Their long lines linger in a reader's mind, frequently popping up in memory just when you need them. This is a gift. She is richly original. Rose has never been a jitterbug, slapdash, look at me kind of girl. She has been the held note the long, loving process, the way we all revive in rain. 
She has indeed shown warm light on our grandmother's soft hair and honored it, honoring all deep time and radiant understanding. She has encouraged the brilliant wellspring of children's voices abiding in our streets and yards and schools and the voices of community writers, even those in juvenile detention, even those who have never been listened to before. She has fought on many fronts for increased literacy, as she knows there is nothing more important. She has changed lives everywhere she goes. I know this firsthand because, oddly, people have often mistaken us for one another and given me their You Changed My Life testimonials. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, Thank you, Rose. <laughs> At various times, we eat more braids, but otherwise, we find this somewhat weird. <laughs> Rose could tell stories about all the work she's done as a Valiant Arts Administrator, a job she held locally for many years for Gemini Inc., and in California for San Francisco's Poetry Center, where she was a Stegner Fellow and did all kinds of amazing work. She left us for a while, but thank goodness she came back. Tonight, this magical night, she will bless us with her poems. Thank you, B, for this wonderful rose from your garden. Please welcome our homegirl, the shining rose of poetry for all the state of Texas. long-standing commitment to work, working for peace, 
which she did for um, for many many years, uh, and also because it's a way I'm I'm uh, used to open things of late. It's uh, I think it is a prayer for peace. It's a, a poem of uh, Taha Muhammad Ali's. Um, it's uh, translated by Peter Cole, Yaya Jazi, and Gabriel Levin. And uh, it's called Revenge. It's the kind of revenge we should all pray for. At times, I wish I could meet in a duel the man who killed my father and raised our home, expelling me into a narrow country. And if he killed me, I'd rest at last. And if I were ready, I would take my revenge. But if it came to light when my rival appeared that he had a mother waiting for him, or a father who put his right hand over the heart's place in his chest whenever his son was late, even by just a quarter hour, <coughs> for me to make sense then I would not kill him, even if I could. Likewise, I would not murder him if it, if it were soon made clear that he had a brother or sisters who loved him and constantly longed to see him. Or if he had a wife to greet him and children who couldn't bear his absence and whom his gifts would thrill. Or if he had friends or companions neighbors he knew, or allies from prison or hospital room, or classmates from his school, asking about him, sending him regards. But if he turned out to be on his own, cut off like a branch from a tree, without a mother or a father, neither sister nor brother, wifeless without child, without kin or neighbors or friends, colleagues or companions, then I'd not add a thing to his pain within that aloneness, not the torment of death, and not the sorrow of passing away. Instead, I'd be content to ignore him when I passed him by on the street, as I convinced myself that paying him no attention in itself was a kind of revenge. Trust up into a series of blips, 
scattering across a hospital monitoring screen, leaving him knowing which words are the last and how they should be spoken. The story of death is infinite in its variety, but the end is always the same. This time it comes with the impersonal scratching of a long distance line, someone saying, sit down and listen, Albie's gone. I clutch the edge of a hard bed in a hot hotel room in an ancient country where there is nothing at this moment except a senseless dead-end present. No past, no future. Downstairs in the courtyard, a woman with a face older than the first sign forgets and shapes corn into cakes intended only for the living. The jaguar leaves his temple stone and godhood behind and lets his claws and teeth go soft with mortality. The orchid suspends its sweetness high in the canopy of the jungle as if there will be no tomorrow, as if yesterday the young bride had not fixed love into her hair. To have come this far to see time snag and eddy around my closest cousin's still warm body. To have come this far to watch him finally drain away in that slow motion torrent he had always claimed as his own rhythm. Today is six years to the day he was buried. I know because Albert just called to tell me that he's a little bit drunk and that he's cooked up a batch of chicken creole and why don't I come on over? And the damn calendar never folds its hands and waits like the rest of us. And yesterday was Father's Day. This year, an even uglier black mark, precisely setting apart the hours between the Sunday his firstborn died and the funeral on Monday. And we talked about growing old and how the body begins to falter, and about the new camper that sleeps too comfortably and when not in use can fall down to only six inches on top of the car. And about taking Luba and Sister Julia to their hometown in the valley to visit an old aunt. And about how electrical engineers have impatiently taken over the function of real watchmakers without having an inkling of how to order the true passage of time. And about the sons who are left. And suddenly, there it is, something more than everything, everywhere, all around. In the mundane inventions of our laughing and living and grieving, in the way we are somehow bound together by this thing called family that each of us celebrates so differently, but sometimes not so differently after all. Just one stop on the way to pick up a loaf of French bread to go with the chicken. Shuffle along. 
You have scarcely a thought of flying, except when I broach the subject. I know what you will say, that it was easier in my day. True, the shades hadn't mounted up quite so thickly. Most citizens still stepped fairly lightly under their loads, and the goodly number among us flew with ease, hardly making a mark on the air. And yes, we flyers were the heroes, no doubt about that. But I keep telling you, we worked hard for it. Anyone who aspired to being lighter than air faced the prospect of everything from sirens to being turned into a dog for his trouble. Still, we did it. Gracefully. Willingly. Not like nowadays when you have people contenting themselves with this or that fragment of memory, a snippet of myth, leaving the real adventures up to a bunch of musty old books hardly anyone reads anymore. But wait, don't go. I really haven't come here just to shame you. The point is, I think we can do something about all this. Come closer. Take off your dress. Let me touch you. Here, and here, and here. Now don't pull away. Let them laugh. Let them make up their ugly stories about the dirty old wanderer who was once a hero, and the crazy woman trying to throw off her blanket of shadows. Let them say we can't couple with time. We can, I tell you. Every step we take closer to one another is one more hope for all of us. There's some danger, of course. The world's clocks and calendars are scattered with the blood of worthy lovers. But look what we stand to gain. The chance to make all this past we reach across tremble and explode with newness. The chance to pitch stars back into the heart of everything. The exquisite chance that you'll join me flying and become the mother of another first child. One who will begin again. One we will have made to tumble out of a wave, wearing only one shadow, her own. Um, I should say about this wonderful uh, chapbook that the original artwork, uh, Von Loschitz's original um, uh, stitchery, is uh, on view in the um, in the reception room, so that you can um, see it and see the incredibly tiny stitches this woman was able to make. Very frightening. Very frightening. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the tale where the maiden lets down her long, charged hair for the lover? His climb to her tower hanging by golden threads, by the very roots of her dreams? This is not that story. <laughs> <laughs> Which even then was vague about who, if anyone, was saved. No, we are just past what some call, without irony, the American century. At my university, Students who own beavers ride bikes into the fields for earth sciences, while brown men from another country buy to other fields for food. The students remember this, the brown men that. They are not the same. I say this as plain fact, though many hope sincerity has been cheapened in our complex age. A little girl called Shelley weeps on her way to the school bus. She wears jellies, cheap plastic copies of a Greek fisherman's <coughs> sandal. She spoke Spanish before English, her Salvadoran mama, her parents at work. 
Pink keys, purple keychains clank against her turquoise backpack. She did not dream last night. Tear stained, she watches a family of lizards careen around the bleached trunk of a dead redwood. Climbs bleached bones in the wedgwood bowl of the sky. I can't see children these days without asking what they'll remember of all this. Am I Shelley's Miss Frances? Strange neighbor woman who dressed me in shawls and sang sadly in German? Whose husband, it was told, went up in flames on the Hindenburg? How do we know what will touch a child? Mark her forever. Remember the girls in their pale summer dresses. Remember the women they became. And then there's the memory locked in the cells, in the blood. Certainly, potatoes are a kind of faith to the Irish. Also, recall Poland. Someone's grandfather escaping under his mother's skirts. This cliche, all that's left of being Polish, Jewish, poor. Even so, the moment, still somewhere in the bone, Potato stubble, smoke, <coughs> strong smell of a woman's skirts, becoming Catholic. Gazing at grandmother, what did she know and how did she learn it? And now we are everywhere and nowhere. Video phones, internet, no borders in the air, fresh blood on the ground. How to dance? Where does memory go in all this? to work in Brumada, a la chancla. We wear the black velvet hat that came with the dream, loosen our tongues with the fire of roasted cheese. The Greek women of Suli danced off the cliff of their village to keep out of the hands of the Turks. And here we are on the purple lip of the Banyon, telling and telling. And there's no such thing as going too near the sun. Each time, and each time, the first. Just past the close of the American century, the child's plastic keys rattle down the street. Veil of poppies. 
one bloom, it is told, for every drop of blood ever shed in a war. Think of it. That Troy wasn't the beginning, or Hitler even close to the end. That poppies contradict, raising stubborn little fists all over the world, yellow in Iceland, white in Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, brown in Africa, everywhere the famous red, that finally all blood is the same color, if memory serves. On Colima Street, it's not yet spring, and there are poppies sleeping in rusty coffee cans. The old woman who dampens the seeds each morning is not the grandmother of the six-year-old who won't speak since her insides were raped to shreds by her mother's junkie boyfriend. He's another version of the poppy, another version of ourselves. And the old woman, the leap of the heart and eye that imagines her to be the grandmother who might yet save the child, these two are versions of the poppy, of Demeter and Guadalupe. And the choice among versions remains ours, like the borders where we either meet or come apart, like everything we do to keep from falling on stone.
And I'm going to read one more. Um, again, in manuscript. Um, Hayden Caruthers was one of my favorite poets, one of my, one of my masters, um, has a book which is truly called Tell Me Again How the White Heron Rises and Flies Across the Napier River at Twilight Toward the Distant Islands. <laughs> uh, and in this book, he has a poem called Up Distress Being Humiliated by the Classical Chinese Poets. <laughs> <laughs> and he writes to the classical Chinese poets as his masters. So um, I have taken a, a leaf from that and I have written to Hayden uh, as my master. And uh, the poem carries an epigraph from Hayden's poem When everything happens at once, no conflicts can occur. <laughs> Letter to the Master on the Possibilities of Timing. <clears throat> master, yesterday in Chinatown, my eyes kept leaving the teeming streets, wizened faces, and piles of trinkets <coughs> to turn up toward the balconies, floating there bright and intricate as the undersides of chrysanthemums. How comfortable with the thousands of years one must be to lean a wet string lock over a railing of gilded dragons. How precisely faithful. Like at dusk, when I stood shifting my weight in the chill, listening to an old jazz man doing Mingus in a doorway. How he said he's forgotten the names of the notes. Now just plays the music. And up it went, that music, alongside dense odors of herbs and incense, keep, keeping precious time with the air until I swear I heard huge wings beating, as if from every shop and alley, ancient cranes, silk, jade, paper, bone, were rising toward that kind of memory that promises just the right timing. My friend Z says the Chinese ideogram for tree can mean many things at the same time. Two trees take the shape of a forest. Simultaneous light and shadow becoming a thousand doorways, all opening into the world, all opening out.
he needed a job to get Mr. Padron back here.